I'm so glad that you're joining us this morning. We've been going through Philippians, and I've got a little bit of a problem this morning. I just need to confess it. My brain works in a way where sometimes songs get stuck in my head. For three days this week, I couldn't get a Pink Floyd song out of my head. And that's okay. It happens to be a song I like. But then I prepared this lesson. And in this lesson, I've got a song at the beginning of the lesson that I really don't like. And by the way, if the person who wrote and sang this song or produced this song or played on this song is watching this on the internet, God bless you. I'm sure you have a ton of other stuff. And who says I'm the taste police when it comes to music anyway? So no offense, please. I just never really liked this song. And because I've put it into the lesson to make a point, it's stuck in my head. And I can't get it out of my head for the last two days. And I don't know if you've got a way of getting songs out of your head. Sing it out loud. I'm afraid that would turn it into cement. <laughs> Carrie Hearn, is there a way to get a song out of your head? My older sister Catherine said if you sing the theme to Sesame Street over and over, it will get it out. But I think she was just doing that to make me look like a fifth grade kid walking around singing the theme to Sesame Street so she could mock me. So I don't know the solution. But let's get into it, and I hope and pray it doesn't get stuck in your head as well. The artist is Alanis Morissette. The name of the song, Ironic. Here are some of the lyrics. I will not play the melody. I won't put up all the lyrics either. An old man turned 98, he won the lottery and died the next day. It's a black fly in your Chardonnay. It's a death row pardon two minutes too late. And isn't it ironic, don't you think? It's like rain on your wedding day. It's a free ride when you've already paid. It's the good advice that you just didn't take. And who would have thought it figures? Or as she says, it figures. Now, this song has always bothered me for a number of reasons. Perhaps one of the most important reasons that causes me to bring you this song this morning is her use of the phrase or the word ironic. Ironic is one of the most misused words in the English language. And so it just kind of barks at me. You can look up in Merriam-Webster's and the core definition of irony, ironic is being the state of irony. So anyway, irony, the use of words to express something other than and especially the opposite of the literal meaning. That's irony. Now there's situational irony, I'll cut her some slack, and that's where something turns out the way it's not expected to turn out, but even that's different than what she's saying. A classic example of true irony is someone saying, oh no, I couldn't possibly eat any cake, as they reach for another slice and start eating it. They're being ironic in that statement. They're, they're saying one thing, but they mean the exact opposite. Oh, you look great today when you don't. Okay. In my brain that really worked because I imagined someone, you know, just looking horrible. I just got out of bed or whatever and, you know, hair is like that. And just to say, oh, you look great when you mean you need to take a shower and get yourself cleaned up. Okay. This is not ironic. Maybe that's the irony. She's saying it's ironic when it's not. I don't think she's that subtle. An old man turned 98, he won the lottery and died the next day. Well, that's not, that's expected. If you're 98, you're not surprised that, that you die because you're getting, you, you've already had a lot of years. It's a black fly in your Chardonnay. 
Now, I thought maybe black fly is some um, slang word that gives this special meaning. So I looked it up. No, it's not a slang word. It's a black fly. A black fly on your Chardonnay. Well, what's ironic about that? That's just a sign you need a different glass to drink out of. I mean, you, flies get in your drink and your food all the time. It's a death row pardon two minutes too late. Well, that's not irony. That's tragedy. Isn't it ironic? No. Don't you think? Yes. That's how I know it's not ironic. It's like rain on your wedding day. That's not irony. That's like, I hope it's an indoor wedding. A free ride when you've already paid. That's not irony. That's nonsensical. If you've paid, it ain't free. It's the good advice you just didn't take. Well, that's stupidity. That's not irony. Who would have thought? I did. Now, I bring this up to you not to waste your time, not just to give people a chance to come on in and sit down, but I bring it up because today in Philippians, we will look at ironic Paul. Paul correctly uses irony. He says one thing when he means something different. He says one thing when he means something that's almost the opposite. This is one of those situations why Scripture is so complex. It's very simple in its core message. You can't read the Bible and not understand God loves you and God died for you. And if you put your trust in Him, you are guaranteed to live eternally with Him. You can't miss it. God so loved the world. Can't miss it. Right there. Big print. Easy to understand. But beyond that, you've got 66 books that are put together in here with all types of literary uh, uh, genres, all types of... I mean, these are real people writing real good stuff. You don't have to be a Christian to read this and appreciate it. You don't have to be a Christian to, to appreciate 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that chapter on love and what love means. So Paul writes, and Paul's a terrific writer in so many ways. I really love it. But he uses irony today, and that's what we're going to look at together. So here's the three-step process for class. Point number one, some things are worth repeating. Some things are worth, all right, well, maybe that's not one of them. But that's the first thing we're going to do. Some things are worth repeating. Second point, beware of the dogs. And third point, let's underscore Paul's irony. So if we do those three things, we'll be done. If we get out a little bit early today, that'll be great. If we don't, it's my fault. Let's start with some things are worth repeating. Here's our, the start of our passage. Paul says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it's safe for you. Now, I've got David Capes, Dr. David Capes over here. He has no clue this is happening. Dr. Capes, would you please come up here for a moment? I have a couple of questions. Yes, come on up. Yes, 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 yes. Come on up. <laughs> now, he truly has no clue this is happening. I'm going to hand him the microphone and I'm going to take this and I'm going to show you that he had his Bible open and he was following along. Get back up here. So, David, among other things, Dr. Capes, who hmm. teaches the Greek class. Which has, starts this week, by the way. Which starts this week. Greek that's cool starts this week. Greek that's cool. Cool, because it's the fall. Oh, autumnal yeah. Greek. Autumnal Greek, yes. Okay. Starts this fall on, on Thursday nights. So. On Thursday nights. Right. How do people need to know about it? Uh, go to the website. Uh, second, this is the second semester, oh. so we're excited about that. So yeah, we've already got the alpha, beta, gamma down. I hope so. Okay, I good. I hope we've got about 100, a language 
is many things. Yes. But it's mostly words. So I, I hear you. You hear me? Okay. I hear you. So anyway, we right. learn some words. David has a New Testament Bible translation. I do. I should have Would brought it. Would you tell us what your Bible translation is? It's called the Voice. It's the actually the full Bible. Uh, we finished it in 2015. It's a uh, as as Russell Moore at uh, Christianity Day calls it a dynamic translation. And explain what a dynamic translation is. It's it tries to take seriously the uh, the context, the ancient context, and bring that same idea, same feeling, same genre into the our our context, our lives. Why, with all of the Bible translations out there, why did you feel a need for another Bible translation? Well, C.S. Lewis said that every generation we need to continue to read and 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 translate the Bible because words change, languages change. Thank you. So, I mean, that's basically it. I mean, languages change, our our context change. We try to make that. You have just supplied all of the background I need for half of class. You can go sit down. You did good. <laughs> I'll, I'll, unless you want to start oh, translating. Please, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So. That is a pristine setup, and I hope you'll remember everything he just said because it's very relevant. Words change. Generations change. We need to have, in our context and in our day, an understanding of what Scripture says. Now, I'm frequently asked this question. What is your favorite translation? And the two that are most used by people, if you count the publishing numbers, are the English Standard Version, which is the one I generally use here in class, and the New International Version. And I've got friends who, who are on the translation boards of, of both of those, uh, and they're wonderful people. They're terrific scholars. They do a, an amazing job. And it's really interesting because I've asked both Peter Williams, who sits and translates for the ESV, and Simon Gathercole, who sits and translates for the NIV, what is your favorite Bible translation? Or what is your answer to that question when you get asked? I wanted to see, do they say, well, <clears throat> I translate the ESV, of course, that's the one I say. Or, I translate the NIV, of course that's the one I say. Do you know what they say? They give the best answer I know. The best translation is the one you'll read. The best, now, and, and so, I, I had dinner with a, a, a marvelous scholar, uh, uh, N.T. Wright, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, Becky and I were, were over and had dinner with him and his wife and some others. And... And, and I was talking to him about translations, and, and he's not a fan of the NIV. And I said to him, why aren't you a fan of the NIV? And he gave me his history, and he's not a fan of some of the passages, but, but even Tom will say, if people will read it, it's the best translation out there. And, and there are places where you can say, I'm not a fan of how the NIV translated that, but there are other places where I say, I'm not a fan of how the English Standard Version translated that. I don't know. But it's useful to have them both. And I thought I'd give you just a small, insignificant way that they're different as we begin this passage. The very first two words, toloipone, Toiloipon, toiloipon is translated finally. And if you had lived in the age of Aristotle and you were listening to someone give a speech or write a letter and they said toiloipon, you'd say, oh, finally, they're at the end. And in classical Greek, that's what it means, finally. But as Dr. Cave said, words change their meaning over time. 
And by the time you get to Paul and his writing, it still can mean finally. But it can also mean what I would say is next point. You know, next point. When I'm trying a case, that's one of the things I frequently say to the witness. I'll be talking about one subject. When I'm getting ready to move to another subject, I'll say next subject or next point. It's a way of letting people know, okay, shifting gears, shifting gears so that they can track with you. Now, you may be looking at this and you may be saying, what's the point? Well, if you read the New International Version, they don't translate it finally. They translate it like next point, further, next point. And whether it's finally or next point, new subject, further, is determined by the context. So the translators are reading it. They have a vote. And some decide, no, nope, this is Paul's final point. Let's keep the, the classic, finally. Some look at it and say, no, Paul's exactly halfway through the letter. Paul's not saying finally. He's saying further. Next point. And the others will say, well, no, 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 he means finally. He's just Paul. And his last point goes on as long as his first point. No, maybe, who knows. So what difference does that make to you and me? I mean, do we want to be, oh, I'm not going to read that blasted NIV. They've got that newfangled translation of Toloi Pone. Or I'm not going to read that. ESV, bunch of antiquated people living in the age of Aristotle. Ah, read them both. Doesn't matter. Here's another illustration, though. Finally, my brothers, in the English Standard Version, look at the New International Version. My brothers and sisters. Hmm. What's going on there? Well, if you look at the Greek... The Greek is adelphoi mu. Mu just means of mine. Adelphoi is in what's called the vocative case. It's a masculine form. So you've got, you've got um, endings that go on Greek words. And the endings like a... Uh, a, a placard that the word wears like um, uh, you know you know those placards where people are walking around the world's at an end and stuff like that and they wear those little sandwich placards you've seen that well think of an ending on a Greek word like a big old thing and it tells you what things about the word how it's used in grammar things like that but this is Adelphoi it's got tagged on it's Adelphos or Adel uh, or it's got tagged onto the end the masculine plural ending, which means brothers. Although, if he's writing to men and women, they didn't say brothers and sisters in the Greek. They just used the masculine. The way we in English did before it was deemed politically incorrect. We talk about mankind instead of man and womankind. We talk about humanity instead of hu-personity. We talk about, you know, you'll, you'll read a lot of people who just say, and, and he da-da-da-da-da when we don't know the gender. We don't say he or she until the last 10 or 15 years, maybe 20 years of writing. And I try to say she or he because I'm from the south and ladies are first. But when you read this in the Greek, Adelphoi, you've got to make a decision based upon the context. Is Paul talking just to the brothers in the church? Or is he talking to the brothers and the sisters? Because the word includes both. So the English Standard Version says, let's just stick to the literal word brothers and trust that the reader can make a decision 
And the NIV says, no, it's clear from the context he's talking collectively, brothers and sisters. So let's add sisters to that. It's not the kind of thing where this, what Paul's saying, he's not writing only to the men in the church. He's writing it to everybody. And the NIV people want to make that point. So there's another difference in translation that's determined by the context and determined by the translators. Now you may be sitting out there saying, this is not going to change the way I live, Mark. Why are you spending time on this? The answer, because this is Bible study. And we need to know these things. We need to understand the tools of God's Word and how they've come to us in our present day language. I'd be interested in knowing how the voice, how you translated this in the voice, David. Do you remember? Brothers and sisters. I think that's a good translation here. So that's what we've got here. Now, whether it's just to the men or whether it's to the men and the women, which clearly it is, here's the commandment. Kyrate. Rejoice. Kyrate is... Um, well, it's, it's rejoice. It's also a greeting. It's what you might say, you know, Hail, good fellow, well met. Kyrate, Doug, great to see you. Kyrate can be a greeting, but it's in an imperative form, present imperative. And Paul's not using it as a greeting here. Not like, um, uh, I wish you reason for rejoicing today. That's kind of what the greeting would be. You know, I, I hope today is a day of rejoicing for you, Beverly. It's, it's Max's birthday yesterday. It was a day of rejoicing for him. Today, he'll be taking care of you and making it all about you, as you did him yesterday. May that be true. Kyrate, may you have a reason to rejoice today. Let me give you a couple of examples of this word. I'm going to give you just two out of Matthew real quick. So you can see the exact same word in the exact same form, how it gets used, because it helps us understand, by the way, one of the rules of translation, and this is a mistake people often make with English Bibles, you, can't, you cannot take one word in one place in the Bible and automatically assume it means the exact same thing thing in another place the that's the substitutionary theory of mathematics and it's not in Greek you can't say well this word always means this and so let me take it over here one of the best examples is the word all pas in the Greek the word all sometimes it means every single one Sometimes it just means everyone in a group. Like, you know, they were all with me this morning. Well, you're not all with me. Some of you are. Some of you are kind of like, <sighs> where are the donuts? And that's okay. But, but you can't just take that word all in the Greek and assume it always means, you know, so when it says uh, uh, that all of Jerusalem went out to be baptized by John the Baptist. That does not mean that the chief priest, that Pilate, that all the Roman soldiers and everybody goes out there and lines up for John the Baptist. Well, it says all. And yet where Paul writes about all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, he doesn't mean just a section. He means everybody. So you can't just automatically substitute, and this is a good word to teach that. So look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 12. Blessed are you, we'll start with verse 11. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Jesus says, rejoice. And be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. Now, that's the same word, rejoice. It seems to be the same admonition that Paul gives. Exact same form, kyrate, rejoice. 
But Jesus uses the word again in Matthew 28, 9 after his resurrection. So the angel says to the woman, I'm, I'm back here in verse 5. Don't be afraid. I know you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen. As he said, come see the place where he laid. Go quickly. Tell his disciples he's risen from the dead. And behold, he's going before you to Galilee. There you'll see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. And boy, that's a real passage of scripture. How were you feeling? I was scared to death and I was so excited. Fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met up with them and said, Kyrate, greetings. Now there it's not an instruction to rejoice. It's the same word. It's the same form. But it just means, may you have reason to rejoice today. It's a greetings is the way it's translated here. And it's a marvelous way to translate it. So within the framework of that, this is such an important word for Paul. In this, uh-oh, sorry, forgot to turn off my phone. Um, such an important word for Paul. And because it's, it's, it's key in the Philippians passage, it's helpful to see other places where Paul uses this word. Because I want to get an idea, is Paul telling me to rejoice when? It's present tense, that means right now. Yeah, but does he know what I'm going through? Today's not a good day for me. Today's not a day of rejoicing. Today's a day of mourning, of weeping, of fear. And Paul's trying to speak into my life, rejoice. What right does Paul even have to speak into my life? He doesn't understand what I'm going through. Maybe this is not one of those times it applies to me. So let's see the way Paul uses it. And I'm going to throw it out in four different passages from Paul. <clears throat> Other than the one we've got here. First we'll look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 11. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. <laughs> to loipon, finally. And here he does mean finally. <laughs> it's right at the end of the book. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Kyrate. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Wow. This seems to link up rejoicing, aiming for restoration, comforting, agreeing with one another, living in peace, with the God of love and peace being with us. Would you like the God of love and peace to be with you? Paul says rejoice. He's used the word four times in Philippians. Other than the one we've just seen, one that we saw before where he said, even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. In other words, if I die a martyr's death, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice, Kyrate, with me. He's saying rejoice even if I am dying a martyr's death. If you get word, Paul lost the trial, Paul was put to death, then rejoice. I spoke at a funeral service on Friday. And um, a dear fella, a dear friend who passed away and there was a lot of issues of how to go about honoring him and his memory but there's a different vibe that happens when someone dies in the Lord it's a cause to rejoice you know, I, I'm, I'm troubled, not as troubled as I should be, but I'm troubled 
by the many Christians around the globe who are dying a martyr's death. What's happened in Afghanistan? Um, uh, I've got a, a friend who works with us who has done mission work over there and was telling me about missionaries who were broadcasting via telephone their worship service. When the bad guys came in and mowed them all down. And in the middle of a song, all you hear is gunfire and it quits. And, and you, you um, hear these stories and you, you, know, you just want to shut them out. And I grieve for the families and I grieve that we're in that situation. But I want to tell you something, I can rejoice. I can rejoice. Because those people are dancing with the Lord. Um, so within the framework of this, what do we do? We rejoice. Paul says in Philippians 4, 4, and we'll get to this later. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Kyrate. Again, I'll say it. He's, he's ordering us. It's imperative. It means this is something you must do. Rejoice in the Lord. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.16. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is not simply... Good advice for living to make you feel better. This is God developing in you and your brain the right neural connections to live the life you ought to live for God. So you rejoice. If it's good, you rejoice. If it's miserable, you rejoice. What does rejoice mean? It means you appreciate the fact that you are where you are with a God who loves you. Who is going to take care of you. And your life can reflect that in faith even if you don't feel it in your heart. Now I ask you, is Paul just some fantasy world guy who thinks everything's you know, Voltaire's Candide and it's all going to work out and everything's just peachy keen, hunky-dory, life is always good. Blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven. No. Paul is a realist all the way home. He knows what it's like to mourn. He knows what it's like to grieve. He knows what it's like to have hardship. He knows more than you and I ever will, most likely. I love what the Australian theologian Peter Thomas O'Brien said about this passage. He said, this was not an admonition to some kind of superficial cheerfulness that closes its eyes to the surrounding circumstances. Oh, life is miserable, but I, that's where Marx was trying to place religion. When he said, religion is the opiate of the masses. It just dulls you to everything that's going on. So you can pretend everything's hunky-dory when it's not. Is that Paul? You just close your eyes? You just take an opiate? No. Paul recognizes God's mighty working in and through those circumstances to fulfill his own gracious purposes in Christ. It recognizes, Paul recognizes, God's at work in whatever you're going through, through those circumstances to fulfill his own purposes in Christ. And they're good purposes, gracious purposes. So when Paul says rejoice, brothers and sisters, he's saying it in spite of what you're going through. Peter uses a little bit different language when he talks about it in 1 Peter 4.13. Peter says, 
1 Peter 4, 13, Peter says this, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, kyrate, same word, same form. Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. God is at work here. Don't ever get confused that this is heaven, that this is the new earth. Don't ever get confused that right here and right now is supposed to be all hunky-dory. It's not. There is a war that goes on. There is a struggle that goes on. And yes, you have wonderful days. I got to speak at a funeral on Friday. I got to speak at a wedding yesterday. We'll talk about your contrasts. There are great days and there are tough days and that's the nature of it. That's where we are now. But Paul says we don't live only looking at these circumstances. We live beyond. We see that in these circumstances is a God who's working out something great. And so if your circumstances are tough and bitter and hurtful and just tragic in ways I can't relate to, I can still say Paul is telling us, rejoice because God is at work. Doesn't mean feel good. Doesn't mean all oh, syrupy, blah de blah de blah. Just means in faith you keep putting that foot in front of the other and you trust in the Lord and you say, Father, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I'm not there and I don't even accept it. But I will move to rejoice in you because if not, everything is futile. And that's where we sit. And that's why when Paul says it here, whoa. That's why when Paul says it here, he says, finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Don't rejoice in something fake. Don't rejoice in getting stoned out of your gourd so you don't think about it. You rejoice in the Lord. Don't rejoice in some escape pod. You rejoice in the Lord. Now, what does that in the Lord mean? There are two main options. I think Paul means them both. I'll just warn you right now. Paul wrote it ambiguously because it applies either way. One means rejoice in the Lord and who God is. You rejoice because we worship a God who is in control. We worship a God who cares about you. We worship a God who calls you by name, who knows your name who knows your thoughts, who has plans for you, who holds you in the hollow of his hand, who died for you. So we can rejoice because of who God is, but another way to read this is we rejoice because we are in Christ and all that that means. We rejoice in the Lord because of our union with him. Because he lives with us and we live with him. And that makes anything we're going through pale in comparison to that true objective reality. God is in you. And you are in him. So that's where we get this. Paul says rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. No trouble. Uh, let's do this quickly. We're running out of time. I don't want to no trouble, uk um, ok neron, no trouble, uh, it's, a, it's an unusual word, it means reluctant, it can mean lazy, it can mean idle, it's just shrinking from something. I don't shrink away from writing this to you. This isn't something where it's like, yeah, this is what Paul already said in the letter. Or yeah, Paul said this in another letter. Or maybe Paul said this when he was with us. Paul's on his rejoice soapbox. Paul says, I don't shrink away from that. I'm not reluctant. I'm not, um, you know, going to just, eh, I don't need to say that again. Because this is something, well, he's, in Greek there's this function of these two words, men and day, when they're together. 
It's like on the one hand and on the other hand. So Paul says, on the one hand, I'm not reluctant. I'm not going to shrink away from saying this to you because on the other hand, whoops, on the other hand, for you, this is safety. This is good for you. It's a safeguard. It's a safe thing. So I'm not going to be lazy about it. I'm not going to be idle about it. I'm not going to say, well, I've already said it before. It's not a bothersome thing for me to tell you again on the one hand, because on the other hand, it's going to help safe you in your life. Rejoice is not just something to try to make you feel better today. Rejoice is not just something to try to make you feel better over the horrible thing that's happened in your life. I'm sorry. Rejoice. Have a good day. No, this is a safeguard for you. If you rejoice, sometimes you don't feel like it. You have to mentally think through it. You've got to pray through it. You've got to figure out, God, I can't rejoice in this. How do I rejoice in this? And you work through it and you struggle through it. And that's your safeguard because that plugs you into the Lord. That helps sustain you in faith when the feelings aren't there. That's what's going on here. Don't get your hopes up. This is just point one. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw this in there. So rejoice in the Lord. Okay, we're not going to get through this in the way I wanted to, but we'll get a little bit further along. We're, we're not going to take forever. Point two, beware the dogs. We can do this quicker. Paul continues, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the fat flesh. Now, if you were reading this in Greek, you'd see this word blepite. It sounds like kyrite, doesn't it? They're both imperatives, present imperatives. That's why they wear that same ending. They sound the same. Blepite from blepo means to look out, to watch, to see. It's a basic Greek verb. You learn it first year Greek. Blepo. Now, it's interesting because the, the, look at the NIV. It just says, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. But Paul's Greek actually uses the word three times. Blepite, blepite, blepite. And this is after kyrite. So kyrite... He's saying, rejoice. And then he's saying, look out, look out, look out. He's being triply redundant. And the, the English Standard Version hits each one of the look out, look out, look out. It's all three. The NIV thinks it reads smoother just to say, watch out once, and then just put everything else afterwards. But Paul's got emphasis there. Paul is saying in the present imperative, look out, see this, see this, not just watch out once. You know, look out, look out, look out. Also in the Greek, Greek has all of these little words, they're called particles, they're just like, sometimes you don't even translate them, they're just nuisances and they drive, about your second year of Greek, they start driving you crazy until you figure them out. When they're not there, the Greek just reads like, that's weird. It's called ascendaton. There are none of those little connecting words in here. Paul's like a machine gun. Da, 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 and it's another way of showing emphasis in the Greek. Look out, look out, look out, look out. Ba, 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 because this is so important for Paul. This is the, the core of the gospel. Remember, Paul sees all of life through the prism of the death of Christ. This is core gospel living for him. This isn't just, oh, by the way. This is extremely important to him. Watch out for the dogs. Look out for the dogs. Now, who were the dogs? Have you thought about that? Those are not the dogs. We view dogs differently today. There was not a pet smart on every corner in the time of Paul. 
dogs were not these cute little things. Dogs were scavengers. They were vicious. They were detested by Roman and Greek society. They were unclean to Jews. In fact, the Jews would call Gentiles. The Goyim, Rick, they'd call them dogs. Gentile dogs. That was not a compliment. And Paul's using that word here. And people say, well, who are the dogs? And some people say, well, this is clearly a reflection of 2 Kings 9.36 when Jezebel's body was eaten up by the dogs. They're devourers of flesh. Well, no, that would make the church Jezebel. That doesn't work. You know, but I can tell you this. Anywhere you turn in Scripture, by and large, dogs are not looked upon favorably in the Old or the New Testament. You say, well, that's just not very fair. Well, they weren't the kind of dogs that we've got now. Your little tizzy was not around at the time. Dogs were vicious scavengers detested by society and unclean to Jews. And if you understand that, our point three is going to make more sense. But here's your point to ponder. Look out. Look out. Look out. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Beware. Be cautious. In this world, look out. Now here is where Paul gets ironic. And it's the verse we've just seen with the next verse. So if I put that verse back up here, let me switch through it. Yeah, look, look, look. Okay, if we put that back up here, Paul's concern were with what we today call, what scholars call, Judaizers. Judaizers. Let me explain what a Judaizer was. If you take everybody that's out there, all of the Gentile believers, the Judaizers believed you needed to feed them into a funnel of certain Jewish rituals. Circumcision, kosher dietary laws, Sabbath, key Jewish rituals because that would take the Gentile believers and turn them into someone who's in the covenant of Abraham. May not be necessary for salvation as much, but it, it certainly is makes them included in the covenant of Abraham as God's covenant people if they follow certain Jewish laws. <clears throat> and to that issue, Paul is writing here. And what Paul says here is pretty simple. Paul says, eh -eh. no. And Paul does so with irony. Paul uses words to express something other than and especially the opposite of the literal meaning. Let me show you the irony. I'm going to have to put verses 2 and 3 together so I've lost the NIV for this. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Now, if we look at this, remember that dogs are unclean and it's a derogatory term for Gentiles, okay? Remember that as we look at this. So what do we have here? Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. This mutilate the flesh over here Katatomain is from katatome, which means to cut in pieces. Uh, tome means to cut, and kata is to cut down, like to chop. So it's chopping into little pieces. Okay? Like you, you see those cooking shows where they're ta -ta 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 and you see those chefs doing that, and you're always, I mean, I'm watching that, all I can do is think I'm looking for a fingertip in my food. 
I do not understand. I'm counting fingers on the chef. I don't understand how they pull that off. They're cutting down. They're catatome. They're cutting it into pieces. They're mutilating it. Okay? Now, here's why this is important. If you look here in the Greek, the way I put it up here, coincidentally, catatome is right above this word peritome. See the T's, the O's, the M's, the long E's? Same, see that? But while this means to cut it into pieces, peri means around. Like up periscope, where you can turn all the way around. Okay? That's the word for circumcision. So peritome means to cut around, to circumcise. Circum, kirkum in Latin, means around. Circumcise means to cut around. It's just from the Latin, whereas peritome is the Greek, circumcision. So Paul says, look out for the dogs, the evildoers. These people who want you to be circumcised to be in the covenant of Abraham are just chopping you to pieces. And we are the real people who are circumcised, who worship by the Spirit of God. Now the irony here is Paul's calling these people who are trying to make the Gentiles be Jews, dogs. Which is what a Gentile is to those same Jews. So when he says, look out for the dogs who are trying to make you be circumcised, when we are the real circumcision, and they're just mutilating the flesh. They're chopping down. They're not chopping around. This is irony. The Judaizers were trying to circumcise the Gentile dogs, but in the process, they were merely mutilating the flesh and becoming dogs themselves. That is, Elanus, I can't wait to hear your song on this. Classic irony. We are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God. And this word worship is really cool. It's not proskuneo, which is your normal Greek word for worship. It's, um, uh, latruo means, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a word that's used especially in the Old Testament to talk about serving at the temple. Not just in the Old Testament though, in ancient Greek literature, the, the temple priests would serve the gods in the temple. So Paul's using a service type of word for worship here. Not just, hey, rejoice and sing praises to the Lord. He's saying, you beware of the Judaizers, the dogs who are chopping down the flesh by trying to make you do that when you're already circumcision, if you're serving God in a priestly way, you're there doing what God wants you to do. It's worship and serve in a priestly way. And then he says, and you glory in Christ Jesus, not in what's happened to you. Not in your flesh. Not because you're circumcised. This is when I survey the wondrous cross. Verses 1 and 2. And if you know this song, this is an incredible hymn. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss. I pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should both save in the death of Christ my Lord, all the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. That's this. I'm not going to put confidence in who I am and what I've got and how I do. I'm going to put my confidence and my glory in Christ Jesus. By the way, we've got one minute, two minutes left, and I'm almost done. But you see the Trinity here? We're the circumcision who worship God. Who else do you worship? You worship no one but God. By the Spirit of God, glorying in Christ Jesus. 
It's just part of Paul's writing, part of Paul's thinking. But it leaves me with this. Rejoice. Look out. And glory in Christ alone. Let me bless you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask your blessings upon the people today. That includes me. All of us, Lord. May you teach us to rejoice. Be present with us in the midst of life's joys and life's agonies. And not in some schmaltzy way, Lord, but in a real true sense of growing us in our faith before you to, to live your purposes. To live your majestic plan, even where it differs from ours. We love you as best as we can, and I pray your blessings on the people in Jesus. Amen.